Hi, it's Eliza. So this video is a gift to the mast cell disease community. We're gonna talk about eight potential pitfalls from the patient's perspective with anxiety and or depression type diagnosis. All right, so these are legitimate diagnoses on occasion um, with patients who genuinely suffer from an anxiety or depressive sort of issue that is based um, psychologically, mentally, emotionally, um, that sort of thing. But what ends up happening, and it doesn't take you very long of participating in the mast cell disease community to understand that these diagnoses can be extremely harmful to mast cell disease patients. And I want to talk about the potential pitfalls related to that. Now, disclaimer, I love my healthcare people. <laughs> So it's it's a little challenging for me to make this video because, um, you know, healthcare professionals just run the gamut and my healthcare professionals are particularly awesome. And so I feel extremely blessed in this regard with my particular physicians. And that is not the case for everyone, nor, you know, is every physician always at the top of their game all the time. Healthcare professionals are human beings and intense amounts of stress. I can't even imagine being a nurse and dealing with all the things that those people deal with. And then physicians giving up like a decade of your life and so many of your relationships and strains on family and all of that. Um, strains on the other things that you, you enjoy doing with your life. I just say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And as a corporate attorney for four years, I got a sneak peek into kind of some of the behind the scenes things that physicians and nurses deal with. And Lord have mercy, seriously, blessing on all of y'all, not to mention all of the strain that you guys have been under with the pandemic. So I feel a little bit weird about releasing this video, especially at this time. However, there are some real problems with these labels within the mast cell disease community. So if you're one of the people who just genuinely wants to help others, and that's why you went into the profession, then you're going to get a lot out of this video. Um, although it is a little bit on the negative side, I apologize. But if you are one of the physicians who went into medicine because you want the social clout, or you wanted those big dollars, or you wanted to be able to, you know, put in all your effort at the front and then pare down to where you're only working two days a week. Okay. Um, but just remember that if you're, you're giving people the wrong diagnosis, that's a major problem. <laughs> <laughs> and patients are going to think badly of you in the future if and when they finally do get their proper diagnosis. And so try to avoid that, that if you can. And I will say, if you're in the more kind of self-centered group of healthcare providers, if, if you're kind of more on that, you know, I wanted the money or I wanted to play golf or I wanted the cloud or I wanted to attract a mate with this new social status that I have. Um, yeah, there's something in it for you too you really dig in and you get to the root of that underlying cause and you treat that and that person's life just exponentially takes off, they are going to love you, like love, love you. All right, so let's proceed with the eight pitfalls that I came up with. This is not an exclusive list. So if you're a patient and you're watching this video, please feel free to add to the list in the comments. I would love to know what you guys think. If you are on the healthcare provider side and you have stories about this that you want to share with the patient or the healthcare community, please also comment. I'd love to hear your perspective on this. And I would love to more fully understand the stressors that healthcare professionals go through um, and maybe the times that you might feel helpless uh, in regard to these pitfalls. Okay, here we go. So pitfall number one, giving someone an anxiety or depression diagnosis can often be like taking their credibility, wadding it to a little ball, flushing it right down the commode. So the society that I live in does not respect um, this sort of illness. They respect cancer. They respect MS. They respect people that are missing limbs. They respect soldiers that go to war, but they often don't respect invisible illnesses unless it's diabetes or heart disease because they know someone that has those. So if you have an invisible illness, that is not common or not something that they have personally experienced, then they're going to be skeptical. They might bully you. Um, family members can bully, gaslight patients. It's really hellacious. There is a history of invalidation of mental illness. Full stop. <laughs> and that can lead family members, coworkers, bosses, 
um, to think that the person who has mast cell disease is making it all up. This can be extremely detrimental to those relationships. It can lead to loss of work. It can lead to loss of friendships. It can lead to the loss of uh, intimate relationship. So this is serious. Um, this is not a joke. So many mast cell disease patients have had to have had these experiences, um, just disastrous. Also, one big problem is that it flushes the patient's credibility down the toilet with other physicians. <laughs> so that's a major, major problem for patients that have atypical anaphylaxis presentations and they go to an emergency room. You can only imagine what the horrors of that are. So this is something that should be considered before slapping someone with that label. Number two, improper treatment plans. So in modern medicine, a lot of times healthcare providers are very familiar with the ills and the evils of clinical diagnoses. And so they're very hesitant to diagnose something that may be less common um, without sort of some sort of blood work or some sort of urine ding or, you know, something in the pathology reports that shows that, yes, this is the problem. And yet... They seem very willing to hand out anxiety and depression diagnoses, which are also clinically diagnosed. So that's a problem. <laughs> um, yeah. And these diagnoses can lead to someone being treated. Yeah, what do you know? And so this person may be being ping-ponged between mental and physical healthcare professionals. The physical healthcare professional says, hey, you've just got anxiety. I can't find anything else wrong with you. You know, you've got this wide-ranging symptomology that I can't figure out. So it's anxiety. So go talk to a mental health care professional. So they do. They sit with the mental health care professional, and it doesn't take very long for them to say there's literally nothing wrong with the way you're thinking about anything. You need a doctor. What's that patient supposed to do? I mean, what a disaster. So this happens frequently. Mass cell patients are ping pong between these two kinds of professionals. Um, and then the other thing is that mass cell patients, unlike true allergy, unlike true IgE mediated allergy, mass cell patients can have their mast cells go off uh, for things that the body doesn't even make IgE for. So yeah, fun times. One of the things that's a trigger for mast cell patients are excipients in medications. This is a known common trigger in the mast cell disease community. So these are things like colors, things that make the pill disintegrate, things that make the pill big enough for someone to actually, you know, pick up with their fingers. Um, so yeah, those kind of things can be a trigger. And so it's not, not, um, it's not super rare that mast cell patients will be tried on these different psychoactive medications that are giving them worse symptoms because it turns out that one of the excipients in the medication is a trigger. And so now not only are they being gaslit by the fact that, oh, your problem is just anxiety, just anxiety as if anxiety was something that, you know, doesn't matter anyway, which it does, but let's just Moving on, that's a separate video. Um, you know, it's just anxiety. Um, and so, yeah, so this person's experiencing these horrible symptoms, worse symptoms on this medication that isn't actually gonna help them at all. So that can be a problem and that happens pretty frequently. Um, obviously a pitfall. And then the patient can be encouraged to continue with the medication. You know, oh, it takes six weeks for this medication to really be effective. Meantime, that patient is being sensitized to this trigger even more. So one thing that mast cell patients experience is that if I keep exposing myself to the same trigger, my reactions can become worse and worse and worse and more severe and more severe and more severe. And so it just can get really out of hand uh, with these, these sort of medications or any medication really. Also, anxiety and depression medications can come with some serious life degrading side effects. <coughs> I mean, I'm talking about things like suicidal ideation, disabling drowsiness, Good luck working with that. So now not only does your boss, you know, you're asking your boss for some kind of accommodation for anxiety. And so you're being looked down on and invalidated for that. But now you're on medications that are going to make you drowsy, seem a little more loopy. And so it's just, it's just increasing this idea that you're not a credible person in everyone's perspective. It can be just a disaster. So 
yeah sexual dysfunction um addiction so yeah if you didn't have problems with anxiety and depression before uh maybe you will as a result of some of these medications that are used to treat this problem that the person doesn't actually have um also anxiety meds could potentially mask the cause of the underlying illness because the person might feel a little too chill about what's going on with them more than they really should all right Two more things on this topic, number two, and then the other topics are a little shorter. So hang with me. Mast cells are present inside the human brain and serotonin is one of the mediators that mast cells release. So it's probably not a great idea um, to be pumping up somebody's serotonin levels when they may be having too much serotonin already. So that can lead to some weird things. And there are several people in the mast cell disease community who have suffered with serotonin syndrome, which is gnarly. So not great. Uh, and talk therapy is expensive. Pitfall number three. These sort of labels, anxiety, depression, kind of ish labels um, can prevent a proper diagnosis. So it can end someone's diagnostic journey prematurely. The patient has all these issues. They go see the physician. The physician convinces them that what they really have is anxiety, depression. Um, and so they're like, great, I can take a pill for that. And it's going to help my world. And so they stop worrying about what might actually be wrong with them and or the credibility problem with the physicians and the gaslighting and whatever. All of this can combine to stop someone's diagnostic journey before they actually know what's wrong with them. <laughs> so that's a problem. Um, further, one thing that contributes to people having delayed diagnosis is that once they are slapped with these labels of anxiety or depression and their credibility is ruined, then all symptoms are going to be interpreted through this lens of anxiety and depression. You know, oh, I'm having um, headaches more than I used to with these episodes. Well, that's that's just anxiety. Oh, I'm having more significant gastrointestinal distress when I'm around XYZ trigger. Oh, well, that's just because you're feeling more anxious about it literally anything can be sort of routed through this lens of anxiety or depression. And so la, 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 I don't really have to listen to you um, or take what you're saying seriously. It can be really, really, really bad depending on the healthcare provider. I'm sure you, if you're a healthcare provider listening to this would never do that, but there are healthcare providers who do. So yeah, medical professionals can become married to a clinical diagnosis um, and these diagnoses, anxiety, depression, we don't really have a lot. We have little to no testing for that. So we're just flying blind with our clinical diagnosis. And then we're going to be married to this diagnosis. And it is a recipe for disaster for a lot of people. Number four, a patient's emotional state. Like, let's say the patient is, just seems always anxious and frantic and or super sad or like deer in the headlight or super angry whenever you see them. You might assume that that is their state throughout their life, and you could be very wrong. <laughs> so after several really bad experiences of going to see physicians and being ping-ponged with psychiatrists and all this stuff, I mean, all the stuff I've laid out already would make someone have some feels, right? I mean, this happens, this doesn't just happen to patients in the, in the mast cell community who are not healthcare providers. This happens to patients in the mast cell community who are healthcare providers. So put yourself in their shoes. Um, that's going to be pretty irritating after a while, to put it mildly. And so the emotions that you might be seeing out of a patient in an appointment are oftentimes in the mast cell disease community could be very legitimate. Um, they've been mistreated. They've been bullied. They've been gaslit. Uh, these people aren't automatons, like robotic automatons who can just absorb all of this um, failure to uh, treat them properly with no feelings. Uh, the other thing is that, um, you know, if you're a healthcare worker and you're wondering, is this person anxious all the time or are they just anxious in here talking to me because they're scared to death that they're going to have yet another doctor's appointment that's going to result in them being no better off and and also them being gaslit and bullied, ask them, just ask them. Um, you might say you appear stressed or anxious. Are you, um, have you had negative experiences with other physicians that you're concerned that I will repeat? Uh, what are your goals for this appointment? I mean, mass cell patients are sort of 
they end up having goals for their doctor's appointments. And if you ask them, what are your goals? They can probably tell you. Um, do you find that you're frequently stressed or anxious and why? Now, granted, you might not know that the person who's in front of you has mast cell disease yet, but maybe you want to ask your patient this question because I, I feel certain that some of these issues probably affect uh, the broader chronic illness or people who have, you know, more out there symptoms of a whole host of illnesses. Number five, expertise of the patient. Healthcare professional, you are an expert at some things because of your training, the money spent, the time you've invested. I am the expert about what's going on in my own body and when it happens. Um, so yeah, full stop. Number six, rare diseases aren't actually rare. <laughs> Shocker. Um, there are so many rare diseases that one in 10 people in the United States has one and they just don't all have the same one, right? So there's so many different rare diseases that you can have one in 10 people with one and there's still rare diseases individually. So the odds that a patient in front of a healthcare provider has a rare disease is like one in 10 or even greater. Cause there's probably some super healthy people who, uh, just don't go to the doctor. Um, yeah. And of course, I'm talking about in the United States. That's where I am. So, you know, maybe we want to let go of this conventional wisdom that says when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras, because one in 10 people is a zebra. And yeah, the 3,000th time you see a head cold, you're going to be an expert on what a head cold looks like. But the 10,000th time you see somebody with some wackadoo symptom presentation, um, that might be because they're sick. <laughs> okay. Number seven, the self-fulfilling prophecy of a common or uncommon diagnosis. So once I say something's uncommon, not going to be looking for that, not going to be testing for that. Oh, amazingly, it's uncommon. Shocker. Once I say something's common, I'm going to be looking for that. I'm going to be seeing it everywhere. I'm going to be seeing it on top of other things that might be going on. Oh, it's so common. Let's just, let's just do this. And guess what? Those diagnoses are probably going to go up. So y'all just have to forgive me for pointing that out. If there are some controls on what's called a common or uncommon illness in the U.S. and you're a healthcare professional or researcher and you know that or a patient, please put a link in the in the comments below. I would love to know what sort of controls are on that uh, to make sure that rare diseases are actually rare because obviously there's not widespread testing on these thousands of rare diseases. Um, and then... How do we know the common ones are common and it's not actually something else that has that maybe, I don't know, as a symptom? Because there are a lot of diseases that have anxiety as a symptom. All right, last one. Number eight, internet searching shows that patient is one of those. All right, this is where I'm gonna get sassy, y'all. So y'all just have to forgive me. I have an attitude about this that I really want to share. I understand that healthcare professionals have different experiences and you guys have seen a lot of really wackadoo stuff and ignorant behavior from patients and patients getting spun up over something they don't have, couldn't possibly have, but they don't have the training to know that they couldn't possibly have it. I get all of that. At the same time, know your patient. There are some patients who that doesn't really fit with. So I agree with the healthcare community. It's your job to figure out what's going on with a patient and treat it. What the mast cell disease patient community would like to say is if you do that, then the patient won't need to. Um, harsh, but true. Number, no, letter B under number eight. Um, Patient lives with their illness, and unless you have the same illness, you don't. So what do you expect the patient to do between testing and visits while their life is going down the tubes, right, with these symptoms that are making them not able to function? Nothing? For how long? Um, you know, many mast cell patients wait decades for a diagnosis, puking, pooping, itching, bleeding. Um, what would you do? And C... I'm pretty sure that I'm just as capable as anyone else of finding and reading a peer-reviewed journal article about any topic that I care to. 
and I ain't too dumb to understand them big words. And if I don't understand a big word, I'm perfectly capable of going to Merriam-Webster's and looking that bad boy up. And if it isn't there, guess what? The internet is huge. And I can find that on a medical website. No problem. So those are eight potential pitfalls um, when dealing with mast cell disease patients related to anxiety and depression diagnoses. So well, let's run through them really quickly one final time to kind of wrap it up. And then I will make my closing statement for this video. One, these diagnoses can flush someone's credibility right down the toilet with friends, families, coworkers, and medical professionals. Number two, it can lead to an improper treatment plan where the person is going to be more sensitized potentially to one of their triggers than they already are and experience a whole host of side effects that bring about other problems with their relationships and work and receiving medical care. Three, it can delay or prevent a proper diagnosis. This happens a lot. Um, go on any mass cell disease forum and you will, in short order, hear a story about someone who it took years or even decades to be diagnosed and in no small part delayed by an anxiety diagnosis. Number four, a patient's emotional state when you see them doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily an indication of their constant emotional state. So yeah, a lot of times they have a real and genuine, healthy, mentally healthy, mentally stable, credible reason for why they're having those feelings when they see you. Number five, patient is the expert on what's happening within their own body in terms of symptoms. Full stop. You are the expert in your chosen specialty. Number six, rare diseases aren't rare. Um, sounds weird, but it's true. Number seven, try not to fall into the self-fulfilling prophecy of what's common or uncommon diagnosis. Ooh, major pitfall. Number eight, internet searching does not necessarily show that the patient is one of those people who struggles with anxiety and depression is obsessively you know, focusing on their illness. It might be that their illness is obsessively irritating them and that they need some treatment so that they can think about something else. Much love to uh, healthcare community and mass cell disease patients out there. I hope that you will take some of these pitfalls to heart. I hope that you will um, continue to try to improve your health and the health of others. And yeah, this is my gift to the mass cell disease community. Even though I don't suffer with an anxiety or depression issue, um, I just wanted to put a voice to some of the things that I know are going on in the mass cell disease patient community. Um, so yes, uh, hang in there and just know that you are not alone if you're a mass cell disease patient. All right. Thanks everybody. Bye.